Good afternoon. My name is Annette Clark and I'm the proud Dean of Seattle University School of Law. Um, welcome to our inaugural lecture series uh, entitled Legal Writing Disruptors. I want to start by giving you just a little bit of context about how this series came to be. Um, during last year's Seattle U Gives fundraising campaign, uh, we decided to focus on our nationally renowned legal writing program. Um, and with the gifts that we received from that fundraising effort, we decided to host a series of legal writing related lectures for the benefit of our law school community. Uh, we're delighted today to have Professor Terry McMurtry Chubb as the inaugural speaker in this series. Um, she was originally scheduled to present in March, but we had to cancel due to the pandemic. Um, so we're very grateful that she's able to join us virtually today. Terry McMurtry Chubb is a professor of law at UIC John Marshall Law School in Chicago. She researches, teaches, and writes in the areas of critical rhetoric, discourse, and genre analysis, and legal history. She's lectured nationally on structural discrimination in educational institutions and the workplace. And she's a leader in designing curricula to facilitate diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. Professor McMurtry Chubb received her BA from Spelman College and her master's and JD degrees from the University of Iowa. She's taught as, at a number of institutions and has a Pacific Northwest and, 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 and in fact a Washington State connection um, because she taught at Fairhaven College of Interdisciplinary Studies at Western Washington University where we, she was the co-founder and the first director of Fairhaven Center for Law, Diversity, and Justice. And I'll just say, we have an amazing pipeline of students from that program, so thank you for creating it. Prior to returning to the Academy, Professor McMurtry Chubb was a civil litigation associate at a mid-sized law firm in Des Moines, Iowa. And at the time she joined the firm, she was the first person of color ever to be hired there and one of two African-American women in the entire state of Iowa in private practice. Before entering private practice, she became the first African-American woman hired as a law clerk for the fifth judicial district of Iowa. Professor McMurtry Chubb has served as the president of the Association of Legal Writing Directors, becoming the first person of color to ever head a national legal writing organization. She's also chaired the Legal Writing Institute Diversity Initiatives Committee and served as the chair of the Iowa National Bar Writing Institute, or I'm sorry, the Iowa National Bar Association. That's the founding chapter of the National Bar Association. She's a prolific scholar and has authored the book, Legal Writing in the Disciplines, A Guide to Legal Writing Mastery. She's a contributor to Feminist Judgments, Rewritten Opinions of the United States Supreme Court. And her articles include The Rhetoric of Race, Redemption, and Will Contests, Inherit, inheritance as Reparations in John Grisham's Sycamore Row, Burn This Bitch Down, Mike Brown, Emmett Till, and the Gendered Politics of Black Parenthood, and hashtag say her name, hashtag Black Women's Lives Matter, State Violence and Policing the Black Female Body. And hot off the press this morning, Professor McMurtry Chubb is this year's recipient of the 2021 Thomas F. Blackwell Memorial Award, for outstanding achievement in the field of legal writing um, given by the Association of Legal Writing Directors and the Legal Writing Institute. And I just wanna read you a quick excerpt from a nominator's statement. Terry has been an inspiration and a mentor to countless number of legal writing teachers and scholars. She is accomplished in all of the areas that the Blackwell Award recognizes, including motivating students at several institutions to excellence, crossing the country on a regular basis to teach other educators and institutions on anti-bias initiatives and curriculum, much of which she has developed herself through her scholarship. She is a leader, a thinker, a writer, and a teacher extraordinaire. She has done everything I can imagine to bring up younger teachers and scholars, and her powerful positivity lit the way for many professors of color in our field." Close quote. Based on her achievements, is it any wonder that we've asked Professor McMurtry Chubb to kick off a lecture series with a theme of legal writing disruption? She'll speak today on the practical implications of unexamined assumptions, disrupting flawed legal arguments to advance the cause of justice. Um, and she let us know that she plans to address yesterday's shocking news 
of a single indictment in the Breonna Taylor case and the protests that followed last night. Please join me in welcoming Professor McMurtry Chubb to Seattle U Law. Thank you so much, Dean Clark. Seattle University Law School has a special place in my heart. Um, there are several people there uh, that I hold dear and who have helped me so much. Um, Lori Benai, um, former Dean Joe Knight, who was my law professor in law school. So, um, and uh, of course, as Dean Clark mentioned, the pipeline program from Western to um, Seattle University. I apologize if you hear dings and things going off. In fact, I just, um, I was told that I received the Blackwell Award yesterday, uh, but had not seen, I have not yet seen the announcement. So what Dean Clark read is the first I've heard of it. And so it's all a bit overwhelming. And of course, alarms are going off all over the place. So please disregard that. So I'm gonna uh, start my presentation and I'm gonna share my screen here. And I apologize. There's a lot of text um, that I need to get through for the presentation so that we can have good dialogue. And I wanted to start off today with talking about Brianna Taylor. Twenty bullets, twenty minutes. For 20 minutes after she was shot, Brianna Taylor lay bleeding, struggling for breath until her last breath. This EMT who trained to save other people's lives was left to die. The police who murdered her walked free. The one who the grand jury indicted was only indicted for the bullets that missed, the bullets that hit the walls of the apartment where Brianna lived the bullets that endangered her neighbors' lives. Yet, for the bullets that entered her body and ended her life, no one has been held to account. Say her name, Brianna Taylor. My presentation today is titled, When Having a Heart for Justice is Not Enough. I wrote this title uh, when I was working on the article that Dean Clark alluded to, um, the practical implications of unexamined assumptions. And I was asked to write a guest blog post for the appellate advocacy blog uh, that was excerpting a bit of my research. And so I just visited the African American History Museum at the Smithsonian, and I had seen uh, a flyer actually from a neighborhood, you know, a neighborhood organization about the recent decision that was the Supreme Court was going to hand down in Baki. And that document was really, it, it was really startling to me because I had not realized there was so much grassroots organizing around Baki before it came out and there was a lot of community outcry about what it would mean. And I mention that today because the conversation that I'm going to start off with this presentation centers about perceptions of who should be in law school, who earned a seat, who took a seat from someone else, that dangerous rhetoric that is very divisive and is not only reflective of the current state of how we view each other in the law school space, but reflective of how we teach students legal reasoning and writing. If you always do what you always did, you will always get what you always got. This quote by Albert Einstein is described the substance in short of what I want to say today. So a business course in genre scholar, those are fancy words for saying that I talk about conversations in the disciplines, how people have them, and the documents that we create in the discipline. I'm also a critical rhetoric scholar, which is an emerging field in rhetoric uh, in, across disciplines, but my colleagues, Lucy uh, Jewell, who is at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and Elizabeth Berenger, who is at Stetson University Law School, together we have originated this uh, emerging discipline of critical race, um, uh, critical rhetoric. And it's a critical race theory and critical feminism for that matter, 
rhetoric and practical advocacy theory. At its heart, we consider how law is a form of rhetoric that entrenches harmful thought patterns about privilege and power. So I'll be talking to you about the research detailed in my article, The Practical Implications of Unexamined Assumptions. Uh, that title, in fact, is taken from an article written by Lori Benai and Ann Inquist, uh, an article that talks about unexamined, uh, unexamined assumptions and how they, they work their way into how lawyers argue cases. And so I wanted to continue that idea and as I was doing this empirical research project, I thought I would honor them and continue the conversation that they began. So I started this project in the academic year 2012. It ended in the academic year 2018. So we're talking about six years of an empirical research project. It involved six unique case files and a required legal writing course. So the research study encompasses 192 students and 576 papers. The students were first semester 2Ls and at the law school where I was teaching at the time, law students in the first semester of their 2L year took legal writing two, which is the advocacy part of legal writing. It's where you write the, your briefs. The students that I taught were majority white students at a law school in the deep south and most were enrolled in constitutional law. Remember, these are first semester two ups. The methodology that I used um, was twofold. The first comes from the genre um, analysis realm in which we study how, how students create documents, allow them to assimilate the thought processes for a particular genre. So how do writers acculturate into a discourse community in a disciplinary community through the things that they write, the documents that they write. I also looked at the colorblind racial attitude scale, which is a really robust scale developed by many social scientists that looks at how, or actually measures um, to what extent colorblind racial attitudes permeate in a particular situation. And I received IRB approval for this uh, empirical research study. In fact, the research, um, the last year I did the study in 2018, the students that I told them when I was writing this up, I said, oh yeah, your class is, is involved. And they were so excited um, to, because they had realized the, the value of what we had done in class together. The assessments, uh, I, each class is guided by learning outcomes and performance criteria. And so I put this slide up here because it's really important to understand that these classes were very well planned. They were guided by specific uh, learning outcomes and performance criteria and different modes of assessment. So uh, throughout the course, we engaged in statutory analysis, I walk the students through critical case reading and briefing exercises. We do note taking exercises, organization and synthesis, then our analysis exercises. Um, and for the purposes of legal writing two or the advocacy part, our motion briefs and appellate briefs. The assignments were three, motion, a motion brief draft, a motion brief final, and then the students switched sides and wrote appellate briefs on the um, issues opposite that they argued on their motion brief. So in my class, I am very intentional about bringing issues of social justice to the fore. And so all of the case files that I develop are social justice oriented. And I am a writer, not just an academic writer, but a, a writer. I'm also a slam poet. Um, and I write in very different genres, which is why my, my Twitter handle is genre mixtress. Um, and so I create these really extensive case files for students where I actually, you know, I write up, I come, I come up with from my, from my imagination, depositions, letters, crime reports, um, I think about who are these characters in this case file. And I actually, you know, 
research where they would live and uh, give them addresses for vacant properties that I search on Zillow. <laughs> and um, based on where I make them live, I look at what Walmart would they go to or what supermarket would they go to? And it's so funny um, for one case study that I wrote, and I wasn't even living in the state where I wrote it at the time, but I had subsequently moved to the state and the students were like, have you ever been to you know this particular town? And I said, why? And they're like, well, that was the Walmart I shopped at when I lived at the address next to the person in our case file. So I think I'm doing a pretty uh, good job. So before I wrote this case file that is the subject of our talk today, I, I became concerned about a narrative that I was hearing from my students. And this narrative had persisted uh, in every law school that I taught, where my students of color were told that they had stolen the seat from a more deserving white student. So either this was done explicitly or implicitly, um, especially when students were in con law and talking about affirmative action and admissions. And I was disheartened to hear that this was still happening um, at the law school where I was teaching while I was, about, while I was writing the case files. Um, and also looking at the toll it took on the students, that it was very difficult for them to kind of navigate an already elitist and um, uh, difficult space with this added burden of someone believing that they shouldn't be there to begin with. So I began to think about how I could address that because I, my case file topics are taken from issues that my students raise over the years or issues that are hot in the press. So examples of some uh, case files that I've written and all of them touch on issues of either race, gender, sexuality, or something of that sort. So I've written um, case files on the admissibility of, of rap lyrics in a criminal trial, um, the ability of an LGBTQ student group um, to limit full membership to certain members of uh, the LGBTQ community um, and case files like that. So this case file actually flips Baki on its head and it involves a challenge to law school legacy admissions policy on the grounds that it created an impermissible unconstitutional racial quota and an unconstitutional race conscious admission system for white students. So my claimant, Mr. Benton, Xavier Benton, he is arguing that a white student took his spot in the law school class. So I wanna tell you a little bit about the universe because it becomes significant for what I'm gonna talk about subsequently. So the law school in my fictional litigation universe is located in West Virginia. According to the 2010 census, and remember I wrote this in 2017, we're about to have a census uh, in 2020. According to the 2010 census, the state demographics were as follows, 93.9% white, 3.41% black, and 0.67% Asian, 0.2% Native American, 1.2% Hispanic or Latino, and 1.46% two or more races, races. So the takeaway here is that West Virginia is overwhelmingly white. And as a person who is writing the case file, I can form shop, right? Because I want the jurisprudence to kind of have been built up in a way that supports what I want to teach the students. The law school is an academic unit within a state land grant institution and must accept the majority of its applicants, 60 to 70% from West Virginia which results in less stringent admission standards for state residents. This is true for most land grant institutions. Non-resident admissions account for the non-white students in each entering law school class. Additionally, weight is given to legacy applicants, defined as those applicants with a relative who graduated the law school and or its attendant university. Because the admissions policies and state demographics the majority of legacy admits are white. Remember, this is a state that's 93.9% uh, white. Most of the people coming from, going to the state institution are white. And so this, this is just the regular result. Legacy admits are admitted with lower undergraduate GPAs and LSAT scores than any other category of admits. So, the white legacy admissions students are getting in with a much lower LSAT rate than the non-white, um, non-state admits. Um, and also of note is that for this case file, I actually produced, I think, seven years of admissions data 
And when I say admissions data, like I gave, you know, charts and graphs and uh, the directives that the the uh, president of the university gave to the admissions committee to focus on legacy admissions um, as a means to preserve the uh, mission of the school, its values, and to in hopes to um, get legacy admits who would donate to the school. So um, in essence, if the administration believed that if it accepted students who were the relatives of graduates that that it would uh, it would spur on the graduates to to give to the university um, and help them through the economic downturn. Also about my law school, I it's in Harpers Ferry. Harpers Ferry is the site of uh, the abolitionist John Brown's infamous raid on a federal arsenal. The admissions literature tells the story of a university built in 1850 by enslaved labor, recounts the events of John Brown's raid and boast about its student chapter, students chapter of the United Daughters of the Confederacy, which was established in 1902. Again, um, the United Daughters of the Confederacy, you might be like, oh my gosh, Professor MC, that's what my students call me, Professor MC. Oh my goodness, right? The, the Daughters of the Confederacy, you're saying that they have a chapter in 2017? Yes, they do. In the town that I just moved from in the deep south, the doors of the Confederacy were alive and well and actually maintained a, maintained a Confederate graveyard that was not uh, far from my house. So at any rate, they had a student chapter, um, which hosts an annual university-wide remembrance of Confederate Memorial Day on April 26. The university prides itself on its balance of Confederate and Unionist views from the time of the Civil War, as demonstrated by its racial affinity groups like BALSA and NALSA and the PALSA and, and CHALSA. The university also awards um, scholarships to the descendants of coal miners to honor their sacrifices and contributions to the Industrial Revolution. This scholarship is specifically designated for the law school and covers the toss, cost of tuition, fees, books, and room and board for three years. It is awarded to West Virginia residents and non-residents, regardless of legacy status. So this is the, the state, West Virginia, and the law school in which my universe is built, oh, uh, in which my universe is built, and in which Mr. Benton is seeking to gain ad admission to West Virginia State University Law School. West Virginia uh, State University is a, is a university. West Virginia Law School is a law school, but there is no West Virginia State University Law School. So this is a fictional law school of my creation. So a bit about our claimant. Xavier Benton is an African-American male, and he's a resident of West Virginia. His father is a professor at the University of Maryland, and both of his parents are graduates of Howard University. Howard University is a historically black college and university in HBCU. Ironically, had Xavier chosen to go to Howard, he would have been a legacy admit there. When he applied to the West Virginia Law School in 2015, he was employed as a biomedical engineer with a medical technology company. He graduated with honors from his chemical engineering program at Howard with a concentration in biotech and medicine. He was attracted to West Virginia State University Law School because they have a very strong intellectual property pro law program, and he wanted to pursue a career as an intellectual property attorney. Despite his 3.75 GPA, which was in the 75th percentile of all applicants in the law school admissions pool, and his 168 LSAT, which is also in the 75th percentile, he was not granted admission. His father told him about the weight of legacy admissions and he looked into it, which is why he subsequently sued the university. And again, he is claiming that a white applicant took his seat. Remember, this is a person with a 3.75 GPA and a 168 LSAT. So what are the unexamined assumptions? During the course of our time together, prior to the students um, turning in their first draft of their motion brief, I learned three things um, in our class discussions. That one, the majority of the students in my class thought that white, white was a neutral racial category, meaning that white was the absence of race. Feeding into that was that only non-white persons have a race. And lastly, that race equals diversity, which excludes white people. So the jurisprudence that we're using in this universe is the affirmative action jurisprudence, focusing on Baki and its progeny. 
The majority opinion in Baki specifically talks about the racialization of whiteness. It doesn't call it that, but it racializes whiteness. And it talks about how racial categories can change over time as a defense for Baki, who is white, um, bringing this lawsuit, uh, alleging that affirmative action um, programs in higher education are somewhat unconstitutional, are, are somehow unconstitutional. So what we're looking at now uh, in the next slide that I'm going to pull up, so understand that the focus of my research was looking at how do these unexamined assumptions about race in this case, in my other case files, race, class, and gender, and intersections of them. How do they lead to flawed legal arguments? And this is what I found with respect to the students in this case file. When students believe that uh, white is a neutral racial category, they believe that legacy admissions are only about class status and not about race. However, I give them, remember, seven years of admissions data in a state that is 93% white, where legacy admissions are overwhelmingly white and are admitted at far uh, higher rates than non-white students with far lesser credentials. And still, they saw it as a class category and not a race category. Only white persons have a race. This uh, flawed legal argument that resulted was a bit shocking to me because when I was reading through briefs, I was wondering why um, the, the claimant or the, the uh, lawyers in the class for Mr. Benton were arguing that he, his race was subject to strict scrutiny. I had to keep reminding them, this is your client. So his race is not an issue here. His race is not the race subject to the strict scrutiny analysis. Remember race as a suspect classification for those of you who've had con law and that it's subject to a strict scrutiny analysis. So again, think about how in practice leading to that conclusion will cause all kinds of errors, right? In your analysis and essentially you're kind of undermining your own client's position. And then third, race automatically equals diversity regardless of the university's stated goals in using it. Remember I told you, I gave them extensive information from the admissions uh, department at the law school and the admissions committee. And in those documents was the directive from the president of the university handed down to the dean as handed down to the admissions committee, which tells them that the goals of the legacy admissions policy were to increase alumni donors and preserve the core values of the university. So how do we disrupt these flawed legal arguments. So we've identified the problem, and now how do we do, how do, we do this? So my first act of disruption is on my twin page. So this is actually a screenshot of my twin page from 2017. And this is a page that, as you know, if your professor uses twin, that students come back to time and time again um, as they're gathering uh, documents for the course. This is the classroom management system, right? And I always put a quote up. And because um, my case files have kind of like a cult following, and students who aren't even in my legal writing section read the case files because they find it so realistic. In fact, I have students who ask me years later, like, how is such and such doing? And I have to say, you realize that person was fictional and out of my imagination. But they become so involved in these cases. Um, and so I kind of put up a preview because I don't give them the case file the first week of class. <laughs> so. The, and I put a quote there. So there's Snoopy typing. He's typing his eternal novel with the uh, beginning phrase, it was a dark stormy night, right? If you know anything about Peanuts, I'm a huge Peanuts fan, so that's Snoopy. And I decided to put this quote up from uh, Sweat V. Painter, which is as follows by Chief Justice Vincent, Chief Justice Vinson. Although the law is a highly learned profession, we are well aware that it is an intensely practical one. The law school, the proving ground for legal learning and practice cannot be effective in isolation from the individuals and institution with which the law interacts. Few students and no one who has practiced law would choose to study in an academic vacuum, removed from the interplay of ideas and the exchange of views with which the law is concerned. So in essence, I want the students to think about why they're at law school occupying these seats. But in a way, this case file is a reflection of them because I know that people in their class have been told they really don't belong because they stole a seat from 
or my students of color being told they don't belong because they stole the seat from a more deserving white candidate. So it's, it's to spark some uh, reflection. It might seem like a small thing, but it's something that the students cue in on um, the further we get into the semester. Next is um, I wanted to provide some context for me teaching in this space. So at the time I taught this law, this uh, case file, I was at a law school in the Deep South named for Walter F. George. Walter F. George was the U.S. Senator from Georgia and the President Pro Tempore of the Senate from 1955 to 1957. He was a principal supporter of the Southern Manifesto and the Southern Manifesto was a kind of a declaration by rabid segregationalists in the House and Senate um, to resist the chaos and confusion of school desegregation. He introduced the Southern Manifesto into the Senate and read it into the congressional record. So this is the law school I was teaching at. Um, this was the person for whom the law school was named. I was the first, uh, well, there were only five uh, tenured professors of color at the time I was there. All of us were African-American and of the five, four of us were still there at the time. <laughs> so I'll let you do the math. So the law school also sits on a historic spot. It is right next to the Cowles Bond House, or known affectionately as the Woodruff House. Woodruff House is where everyone gets together to have, um, to get together for events that are like, you know, connected to law schools. If there's a law school symposium, usually a luncheon will be held in the Woodruff House, etc. cetera. Um, and also because the, the um, law school itself does not allow, or the university does not allow liquor on campus. And so the Cowles Bond House is actually off campus. So um, it is a Greek revival home built by the noted architect Elam Alexandra, uh, El Elam Alexander, excuse me, for a railroad entrepreneur. In 1847, it became home of the home of the richest planter in Georgia. So the richest plantation owner in the state of Georgia at the law school I was teaching lived in this house right next to the law school where I was teaching. Um, and his name was Joseph Bonds, and he was murdered in 1859 by his former overseer after Bond dismissed him for mistreating one of his 1,300 slaves. So think about the amount of wealth that Mr. Uh, Bonds had to have in 1847 to have 1,300 slaves. And these slaves, these 1,300 enslaved individuals were likely working on a cotton plantation. And in 1887, the, this is the reason why it was named a historic site, it was the site of the 16th birthday of Winnie Davis, daughter of Jefferson Davis. Um, and so there's a historic marker at the law school, and, it's, and this is where Jefferson Davis gathered the citizens of Georgia, making Georgia together at the end of the war to tell them that the South had lost. Um, and the law school awarded an honorary law degree to um, Jefferson Davis on the anniversary of the Battle of, of um, Apatamax. So you get the idea of I'm teaching these ideas in this space and I want to bring this up because, and hopefully we'll, we'll talk about this a bit in the, in the Q and A, um, but uh, you know, there's all this discussion about changing the curriculum, professors bringing in more diversity, equity, and inclusion items. And one thing to think about um, is who is the person delivering the information because law professors of color have been delivering this type of content forever, yet students push back and you know write things on evaluations like, well, I didn't sign up to, to learn about race, I signed up to learn about comm law, right? Or I didn't sign up to learn about race, but I signed up to learn legal writing. So just think about that as you're pushing for change. Okay, I'm going to wrap this up soon so we can have a talk. The critical pedagogies that I used were case reading dialogues where I break the case apart and we walk through a critical reading with the students together. Um, they're all annotated out, highlighted, color coded. Um, I do model case briefing and how to build analytical frameworks. I do live expert interviews so that students can um, 
you know, engage in questioning an expert to see the marriage of fact and theory. And this is, in doing so, I um, bring in people of color and women as my expert interviews to kind of break the mold of who can do what. And so for this particular case file, I brought in our director of development and our director of alumni and um, uh, both were women and one was a woman of color um, necessary. And they were experts that we could use um, in crafting our briefs. And then I, of course, use legal briefs from key presidential cases to show them the options that the lawyers had at their disposal in arguing and digitize legal arguments. So I wanted to share with you the results. Um, the first draft of the motion brief, 75% of the students in the class demonstrated a limited awareness of white privilege and how institutional discrimination functions. So they were essentially, 75% of the class was detrimentally colorblind. By the final draft of our motion brief with all uh, implementing these disruptive pedagogies, that number had reduced to 32% of students who had a limited awareness of white privilege and how institutional discrimination functions. And by the final appellate brief, that number had reduced even still to 11%. I call that a victory. And through all of the case files, the results are this dramatic. The results were also more self-reflection about the student's place in law school and the profession, greater engagement with issues as they arose in public discourse. Students began to email me and text me when the um, affirmative action case at Harvard came up um, with the Asian students and, you know, talking about, uh, they were following the arguments, they were talking about uh, the types of arguments that the attorneys made and why they were flawed and identifying um, how certain racial assumptions led to flawed legal arguments. Uh, so they were doing the same thing that we had done in class um, throughout the course of our time together. And higher participation in constitutional law. Um, students write and as they write, they learn, right? So my students had bragging rights when constitutional, when their constitutional law section got to strict and intermediate scrutiny and they, and rational basis, and they own those classes. I mean, they would come telling me like, everyone was really shocked that we, you know, could talk about the issues with such nuance. Our con law professor um, was this shocked that we were so good at this. And so um, legal writing, of course, has an impact on students' understanding in other subject matter specific classes. It, I would be remiss if I didn't mention, um, and I'm going to end my presentation with this, that on September 22nd, the president issued an executive order titled Combating Race and Sex Stereotyping. And I just want to read you some excerpts, some brief excerpts from this executive order. This is a executive order basically um, legalizing what the Office of Management and Business um, identified in its memo about two weeks ago which was that it, in the OMB memo, it described critical race theory as propaganda that was dangerous to Americans. And so this uh, executive order kind of solidifies that. And I want you to be aware of the threat to your education, to your critical education, um, as kind of a call to arms, if you will, a call to push back with our words and with our actions. Um, but the president calls for pushing of a different kind. Many people are pushing a different vision of America that is grounded in hierarchies based on collective social and political identities, rather than an inherent and equal dignity of every person as an individual. This ideology is rooted in the pernicious and false belief that America is an irredeemably racist and sexist country, that some people simply on account of their race or sex are oppressors, and that racial and sexual identities are more important than our common status as human beings in America. Anyone who has taken a history class at the undergraduate or graduate level, or even at the high school level, will know that there's not one vision of American history and the one that we've been presented for very long, indeed, um, kind of cast some people as villains and some people uh, as victors. And the villains are often those people who are marginalized. So is America racist and sexist? You betcha, irredeemably, I hope not. Moving on, the executive order states, this destructive ideology is grounded in misrepresentations of our country's history and its role in the world. That statement in itself is not true. And finally, unfortunately, this malign ideology is now migrating from the fringes of American society and threatens to infect core institutions of our country, 
instructors and materials teaching that men and members of certain races, as well as our most venerable institutions are inherently sexist and racist, are appearing in workplace diversity trainings across the country, even in components of the federal government and among federal contractors. So I'll end here um, again as a call to arms and to tell you that to the extent that you want this type of programming that your dean, your legal writing program, your university, the core mission of your university holds so dear, um, that you may be soon called to fight for it. Fight for it in your petitions, fight for it in um, direct action, fight for it with your words, but understand that the things that we thought we were allowed to do are up for grabs and our institutions are coming under fire. Um, and that this directive, while now um, applicable to the federal government, federal contractors and federal agencies, it will shortly trickle down to K through 12 education to, and then to higher education and professional education. So with that, I will end and be happy to take any questions. Thank you for this opportunity to engage in such important issues with you today. Great, so I just wanna start by saying thank you for that um, amazing talk that was incredibly thought provoking. Um, there are a huge number of students and also faculty um, and, uh, oh, and I'm getting notes in the um, chat asking can we applaud so yes if everybody wants to take a <laughs> second then you can turn on your cameras and you can applaud for professor mcmurtry chubb in this talk um and uh feel free to send me questions in the chat i've got a few that i'll get going but let's just take a second um and uh, express our appreciation now thank you <laughs> all right so with that i'm going to start with one with the first question and people can send them my way. Um, let me just take let me start out with kind of moderators privilege and pick up on the very last thing you were talking about. Um, you were talking about fighting for um, teaching uh, critical legal theory, critical race theory um, in workplaces and schools um, and that we are all going to need to fight for the ability to do that. Um, if you were talking to a law student who says, what should I be doing? What should I be doing with my, you know, externships and summer jobs? Um, what should I be doing in the classroom? How would you answer that student? Well, I think, you know, we as legal educators have to equip students with these tools so that when they go into their externships and internships that they can identify and, uh, and bring to the recognition of the people with whom they are working these uh, unexamined assumptions and flawed legal arguments. So I think, you know, unless we give them the tools, unless they are able to explore that through coursework and conversations with their colleagues and us, um, then they may not be able to do that in their internships and externships. To, to the extent they can, um, you know, they've got to be willing to be brave in many aspects and to also understand how to present the issue, you know. Um, you know, it's not, a, it shouldn't go nuclear as a first result, right? <laughs> or as a first resort. <laughs> so you might want to, you know, broach the question and say, hey, you know, I've noticed that this is happening and that maybe our office is doing this or maybe some policies that are leading to some disproportionate results that we don't want. And I would really love to head up a project to address that. Um, so taking the initiative, um, being gracious, being understanding, understanding that for the most part, people aren't acting maliciously, but also not being naive when it's clear that they are. Great, thank you. And that leads to another question somebody sent. Um, what are your thoughts about disrupting how law is taught in other classes? Um, if you could remake legal education, how would you do it? That's an excellent question. And my dean is actually giving me to, the ability to do that and our, and our faculty. <laughs> So we're engaged in creating an anti-racist law, the core law curriculum. Um, and that would be my uh, advice <laughs> for disrupting legal education is burn it down. <laughs> Let's start over <laughs> um, because you cannot get clean water out of a dirty well <laughs> and you can try to filter it, <laughs> but we see how well that's working for us. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, 
A question that has a uh, particular significance in light of Justice Ginsburg's death in the opening on the Supreme Court. Um, what are your thoughts on the Supreme Court's affirmative action case law? Um, do the justices need to see their own assumptions disrupted? Yeah, one of the things I've been writing about recently, and I have an article coming out soon on do, does black li do black lives matter in the law school curriculum. And in that, I kind of interrogate uh, Justice O'Connor's rhetoric in um, Grutter in which she talks about the benefits of having a diverse law school um, and all those benefits, the benefits that flow from having a diverse law school. And the benefits that flow from having a diverse law school, as she frames her rhetoric, go directly to white students, but at the expense of students of color. <laughs> so students of color are expected to create lively conversations about race. Students of color are expected to be, to earn our keep in the seats that we have in, in law school. And I think that that is the unexamined assumption on which the affirmative action jurisprudence is built, which is why we keep litigating the same issues in the same way. One of the reasons we keep litigating the, these issues in the same way. All right, let's see. And now I'm trying to sift through, or not sift through, but I'm trying to sort of take questions in and <laughs> listen to your answers. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, somebody asks, what changes need to happen in legal academia as a whole? Um, what are some barriers you see um, in legal academia to the kind of reform you were talking about a few minutes ago? Well, with students, I think the first question we have to ask ourselves is, one of the first questions that we have to ask ourselves is, does the LSAT have a place in anti-racist legal education? <laughs> um, and for me, the answer is no, it does not. Um, and so I think this artificial uh, ranking and sorting uh, that's driven by US News and World Report, that law schools are forced to adhere to um, in, in LSAT scores is detrimental and works to undermine our ability to have a diverse, equitable, and inclusive law school. At the faculty hiring level, law faculty hiring is, to put a, it in a word, crazy. It's elitist. Um, the majority of law professors come from just four schools in the United States. That's crazy. So you have the majority of four schools that are essentially driving legal education. We haven't really changed much in our core law curriculum since 1896 in Christopher Columbus Langdale, right? So I think that our understanding of who can teach us the law and where we get those people from has to change if we're going to change the law school itself. And then we have to be willing to understand that the law, the, that the legal education structure that we haven't challenged since the 1890s has a historical context that it arises in at a time where um, we're in the Industrial Revolution and we're in what historians have called the Gilded Age, which is kind of like I think of the 80s and Gordon Gecko and like, you know, greed is good, right? Um, and so that the legal education arose in a, in a context to support capitalism. And in the United States, our capitalism is racialized capitalism. And so legal education uh, exists in service to capitalism. And unless we challenge that, we're not going to get anywhere. We're not going to change how we do business as uh, law schools. Um, and, and in a way, I think this next question sort of relates to, to that answer. Um, so a student asks, uh, I have found that trying to explain inequality to the people who benefit from it or who are unaware of it is nearly impossible. Uh, I find it very difficult to put into words. Um, to, to put these dynamics into words when talking to people who genuinely believe discrimination no longer exists. Uh, how would you suggest we effectively engage in legal or in everyday debate? Um, and how do we respond to um, overwhelming and at times willful ignorance? That's a great question. I think, as you know, the person who answered the question, that's difficult, right? Um, and what I've learned over the years is that information doesn't lead to transformation. I think it's this belief among educators and you all in law school are, who are highly intelligent people who believe that if we can just get them enough information that they're going to change. But people make sense of the world based on their ontology, how they believe they are, and their epistemology, um, how they understand the world around, their, their belief system. And so they make sense of the world based on those two things. And to the extent that those two things are limited, they're, uh, they're gonna make sense of different information in different ways. You can present the same information as we're seeing on a national scale, right? You can pre present the same information to two different groups 
and based on how they understand the world, they'll interpret it differently. And so my solution to that uh, has been to kind of meet people where they are and to employ empathy and so that they understand me as a person and then maybe more willing to step outside of their current belief system and maybe believe something different. So one of my favorite examples of this is in a critical race theory class. I had a student who came to that class, my like critical race, it was then critical race theory, critical race feminism. And I often have students take that class because they've had any legal writing. And so they say, okay, let's take this other, I trust her now. Um, so let's take another class with her. And one of, in this particular class, I only had one white male student. And so all of my students, of, and I have the students journal every week and I, those journals are uh, private and I respond to the students um, individually. And so I had, and this was like right after 20, the 2016 election. And so I had, um, the students were journaling and they're like, Professor MC, I think he's a spy. Like he's in here to like subvert our, our whole being. And I'm like, okay, this is I'd be like, at some point we're gonna have to address this. And so my student, my white male student was like, you know, he was writing things in his journal and he was like, you know, I really want to take this class. I'm married to a woman of color. I really want to understand about what's confronting her and our kids. I don't know how. And he was raised like as a, in a very conservative kind of Pentecostal Christian commune. Um, and he voted for the current occupant of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. And so I was like, oh brother, what's going to happen in class when this is like going to come out? And so like we're in class and he just completely like, during a discussion, he says, I voted for President Trump. Well, oh my, I look around the room looking at my students. They're like, oh my God, we knew it. Like we knew that he was a subversive person. And what followed next was I think one of one of my one of the the highlights of my time as an educator, uh, which is that the students start talking to each other. And so they asked him, Well, why did you vote for, for President Trump? And he said, Well, you know. He, and he had he had reasons that he hadn't connected in his mind to the rhetoric that was being um, to the misogynist and misogynistic and racist rhetoric that was being bandied about. Right. For him, he had certain defined issues that he wanted addressed. And this platform did it. Everything else he wasn't paying attention to because he didn't believe that it affected him. And so over the course of the se semester, students got to understand where he was coming from and he got to understand where they were coming from. And he. I can say from reading his private journal entries that his thought processes really transformed at that point because he felt like these were people, although they were completely different from him in every single way, that they were willing to listen to him. And when they were willing to listen to him, then he was willing to listen to them. And we were able to have a dialogue that, that didn't just separate us and polarize us. And we had a dialogue over the 15 weeks that did lead to some transformation. Um, having said that, there are some people who just don't want to, they don't, they want to interpret the information the way they want to interpret it. And you're never going to save those people and you're not going to reach them. And so I'm not a person that engages in futile endeavors. So I'm like, you know what, at some point, there's some people who you're just not going to convince, but darn it, you can certainly work on the people who you might be able to. Well, you know, I think that brings us nicely to what I think will unfortunately have to be the last question. Um, as a student, how do I do my um, studies and stay positive during this time? Uh, how do I focus on my studies when so much is going around me, going on around me? Well, first and foremost, it's okay to press the pause button. Um, you have to take care of yourself. And so like this morning, because I was feeling pretty beat up about yesterday and, you know, I had this very high high where I was told I was getting this award and it's very low low when I'm looking at literally outside my window and seeing protests and helicopters and police. Um, and so to, this morning I had a, a raw matcha cake for breakfast. Um, <laughs> Um, and that was very delightful um, and part of my self-care for today. I didn't do my daily yoga, which, you know, I blew it off, right? Because I was like, I, I want to sleep in because I couldn't settle down last night. Um, and so it's okay to press the pause button, right? The second thing, though, is that know that, and I, I'm sure I say this confidently. I usually don't like to speak for other people, but I say this confidently um, with your professors, that we are so incredibly grateful and hope, and you give us hope because you're studying law, and especially at Seattle U, you are being trained to be a, tra a change agent. And so know that your presence at the law school is giving 
me hope across the country is giving everyone hope um, that we're going to, you know, right the ship and, and change things. So if, if that doesn't serve to keep you up um, in, in spirits, then, you know, <laughs> so eat more matcha cake uh, <laughs> or chocolate. <laughs> All right. I can't think of better sort of parting words and advice than that. Uh, thank you so much. This was a fantastic hour. Um, I, we're getting lots of questions asking if it would be okay if we shared your PowerPoint presentation with students who are in attendance and who want to go back and look at it. Um, so Absolutely. I will do that. And um, you can hit me up at my UIC email address or on social media and at Twitter at, at genre mixtress. Um, and that is on the first slide of my PowerPoint presentation. Fantastic, all right, thanks again. And I hope that this will be just the beginning of a, of a longer conversation with you. Thanks everyone.